It's the most special time of the year, a full two weeks for each TV guide, the teleworlds bedecked with tinsel, whilst the sun's still blazing in the sky. Drifts of paper snow are slowly falling. Presenters are scoffing at mince pies, in their jolly sweaters sweating, because outside really, it's July. They're dancing festive numbers, in woolen hats all warm and toast eye, singing carols around sprayed pine trees whilst the sun still blazes in the sky. There's really too much glitter, fake snowballs are gently flying by, the reindeer are all a skitter because outside it's mid-July. Santa finds he's on the move again, when he should be sound asleep. Supporting artists, fat and short, wrap up tight as the sun shines in the sky. Scarves and mittens, all warm and snug, sweat dripping down from tighted thighs. Such a lot of Christmas puddings when outside it's baking hot July. The Vicks bedecked with festive bunting, like it has been for weeks gone by. The doctor's sonics needing antifreeze, though the sun's blazing in the sky. Local news already has a trio. Festive games played by any celebrity, pulling out their corny cracker gags, despite all knowing that it's July. They're off to visit hospitals, worried about the old and lone lie, preparing to make their guilt trips whilst the sun burns bright and high. It's Christmas on the telly, every newsroom's got a fir tree, tinseled puddings on the eye dents. Strange graphics to work on in July. Snowflakes are gently falling upon favourite dramas. Extended special eye, sending actors to less sunnier climes while sunshine's blazing in the sky, to spend their special bigger budgets, fulfilling those longer running times, the method means they're shivering. Yet it's still the middle of July, and New Year's Eve is soon upon us, everywhere there are kilts, remember? It's Hogmanay, they scream and shout, yet outside it's September. <laughs> The operation was a success, but the patient died. What made you think the surgeon was negligent, Mrs. Meadows? I know she was. It wasn't my fault. Someone had to take the blame. It was ultimately your responsibility. What about her bosses? It's easy for them. They don't have a man's death on their conscience. Attribution and Retribution in Kavanagh QC, Monday at 8.30 on Central. Hello! Hello. I'm Andrew. I'm Lisa. Welcome to episode 31 of Round the Archives. Yes, indeed. It's January 2019. Yes, Happy New Year. And although Christmas has come and gone... Yes, in uh, a flash. In a flash. I, I had to open with Martin's... Um, Christmas poem. And why would that be? Because I forgot to put it on the Christmas episode. Okay. So thank you to Mr. Martin Holmes, yes. who you'll be hearing mm -hmm. several times during this edition. Mm. And I didn't want to wait till next Christmas to no, use it. that would be a long time. But the joke is that it's about Christmas in July and we yes. end up using it in January. Yes, so. so it still works. So there we go. Mm. Um, what else is exciting? Well, I know mm. one thing that's exciting. As, okay. of, as of today, in fact... Mm -hmm. An announcement of two recovered episodes from the Likely Lads. Okay. So A Star is Born and Far Away Places, mm -hmm. both from season two. Right. A uh, Star is Born from the 23rd of June 1965 and Far Away Places from the 14th of July 1965, okay. which will be available on DVD from Network. Very soon. Very soon indeed. Mm -hmm. Most exciting. Yes. And we've seen a little clip from both of we them, have. haven't they? So yeah. they, they, they look interesting. They do, yes. It was like a bit of the likely lads. Yeah. Um, he got, saw, got to see Terry's mum. You know, I don't think you really see Terry's parents that much. You see his sister, but you don't see his sort of parents. Yeah, in the early stuff, you occasionally see them. Because um, there's a line in a very early episode about Dad wants to watch Doctor Who. All right, okay. Do you remember that? No. No. <laughs> anyway. Um, but our... Uh, one of our aims for 2019 or 2019 mm -hmm. yes. is to get new voices on board. Yes, indeed. So we're very pleased to mm -hmm. have as our first two new voices yes. of this year, mm -hmm. Simon Exton and Ken Moss yes. 
from the lovely podcast The Exton Moss Experiment. Yes. Who will join us to look at Kavanagh QC. The Exton Moss Experiment. Adventures in Wine and Space with Simon Exton and Ken Moss. Hello, I'm Ken Moss. I'm Simon Exton. And we do a podcast called The Exton Moss Experiment, which looks at old archive television. Got our name from the Quatermass Experiment, which is the first thing that we started looking at, and we're slowly working our way through the different Quatermass serials, and also the, the works of Nigel Neal in among all the rest of the, the stuff that we look at. We tend to do themed episodes um, and quite a bit of Doctor Who, because we originally met as Doctor Who fans. And I've known Andy from Round the Archives for a lot of years. We first met in the late 80s when we were both working in a chemistry laboratory down in Poole in Dorset, and we've stayed friends ever since. And to give you a little taster of what we do on our podcast, we're going to watch an, a piece of Nigel Neal television and then comment on it afterwards. And what we're going to watch is the, what I believe is the last piece of television that Nigel Neal wrote, which is an episode of Kavanagh QC from 1997, and it's called Ancient History. It stars John Thor as the lawyer Kavanagh, and it ran for, I think, seven seasons in the late 90s to early 2000s. So the episode, as I say, the episode we're going to watch is Ancient History. We'll watch that and let you know what we think afterwards. Roll VT. Roll VT. Right, well, that was Kavanagh QC Ancient History, an episode from 1997. A very nice piece of TV. I enjoyed that from beginning to end. Nigel Neal's final script. I remember watching this at the time. I've watched it a few times since. I think it's a fantastic and very powerful piece of television. Deals very well and sensitively with a very difficult subject, um, that of war crimes and crimes within the concentration camps in Germany. And this particular instance dealing with the um, camp at Dachau. And freezing experiments, which I must say that's passed me by. I didn't know that they had been those experiments. Unless I, I honestly don't system. know. No. Um, it's something I need to read up on now. I believe there was a, there's an awful lot of stuff that we just don't know, don't know whether it happened happened or not. It's not something I know a great deal about, kind of not something I've really wanted to know a great deal about. It's a very clever script. The plot in, revolves around the accusation of war crimes against a, a doctor who was in the Dachau concentration camp. His contention is that he was in there as a prisoner. The crime he's accused of is having been there as a doctor directing medical experiments into freezing people and trying to bring them back to life afterwards. And the uh, the argument was that he escaped from the camp by shooting and wearing the clothes of one of the inmates who died and taking on his identity. And they have a a number of um, witnesses for this, the most compelling one of which... Uh, is an, a frail old man who dies in between the initial hearing and the well, and, and the, and the, yeah. the trial at the Old Bailey. Kavanagh, who's prosecuting, isn't able to bring this witness and his testimony. There are other witnesses. There's a fantastic performance by Warren Mitchell. Warren Mitchell. We, we tend to think of as a, a comedic actor, and he's a very good comedic actor, but he puts in a brilliant straight performance in this. I'd rather watch him straight than as a comedy actor, quite frankly. He, he does that so well. And how much of that is because Alf Garnett is such an unpleasant character to watch? That Oh, no, I've seen him as, as, uh, in straight roles and other things, and, and comedy roles and other things. Mm. And I just think when he's when he does that quite unpleasant, serious side that he, that he brings out in certain roles, there was, a, there was an episode of something, I think it was just a, a one-off called Secrets. I think it was by the... Python. It was by Michael Palin, certainly, and Terry Jones. It was set in a chocolate factory where they were putting people in the sweets. It was mental. Um, but he played the factory owner, and it was quite a dark performance. Mm. Uh, and he, he was just captivating to watch in, in a serious role, yeah. uh, as he was in this. And he, he was very good in this. Um, I don't think there's a standout performance in this because everybody, everybody is really is. good. It looks as though the prosecution 
case is going to fall apart because of the loss of this witness. There are other witnesses, um, but they, they don't tell as compelling a story as this old man. And the defence team decides that to, uh, as the icing on the cake to um, prove the innocence of their, their client, they're going to bring along somebody who knew him from the, uh, as a, a prisoner from the camp. So they, they find this um, frail old lady in a, uh, in a nursing home who recognises his picture and is very tearful and emotional and says, oh, he, he was my life in the camp. When she comes to give evidence, what she actually means by that is he was the one who saved her life after having taken it. Well, through the so, freezing experience, it's freezing people to death yeah. and then essentially resurrecting them. So by a stroke of accident, she proves the prosecution's case rather than proving the defence case. And at that point, the defendant um, admits to, to what he's done. And there's a, a wonderful shot, uh, uh, an old bugger moment from Bill Nye as the defence counsel. When he realises realize just... his star witness has actually dropped him right in it. Yeah. The, the new one, when it comes, I, I actually had a bit of a problem with, because all the way through, Dr Beck, as played by Frederick Treves, no, 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 this is all false, it's all false, you're mistaken. He puts on a, this performance, and then a frail old woman who's testimony isn't that solid really he just crumbles and, and just confesses he, that was the bit I had a problem but he with. crumbles and confesses after he sees that his wife believes the witness ah I did, that didn't come across to me right so he's had 50 <clears throat> odd years of this new persona and has built up the family life around because he, he a short but very good performance by Rowena Cooper saying how she'd helped him uh, when she was an aid worker to get to to England to, to study medicine and then having come to, to England, he set up this new life, um, met the, the woman he was to, to marry, had, had a family life. So he was living that persona for 50 odd years. My take was that he, rec- because he recognised that that life was gone, his wife believed the old woman in, in the dock. That's how it all fell apart. Then right. Now it makes more sense, yeah. It, it kind of negated the, uh, the life that he'd had in England and brought back the life that he'd had in, in Germany, and he was, he was originally Polish. You did actually drop in, while we were watching it, a, a little factoid about Judith Kerr, Nigel Neal's wife. Nig- Nigel Neal's wife was a German Jew who had escaped the beginnings of the Nazi persecution. She, uh, she and her family had moved to eventually England via Switzerland, I think. In 1933, her father had been a writer and his books had been burnt and the family had seen the writing on the wall and got out of Germany before before there were real repercussions against the, uh, the Jewish people. I, think. I know that the, uh, the repercussions started a long time before the beginning of the Second World War where we got involved. But her family was able to eventually move to England and she was working as a scriptwriter in the BBC when she met Nigel Neal. Then she became better known for a writer of children's books. She wrote the, uh, the Mog Illustrated books. Oh, right. And there's a semi-autobiographical book called When Hitler Stole Pink Rabbit. Oh, it sounds charming. Um, I've not read it. it. It's supposed to be a bit sort of book thiefy. <laughs> a bit book thiefy. A good description. Uh, it might be better than The Book Thief, because I didn't particularly like The Book Thief as a book, <laughs> to be honest. But... Um, for, I've never seen all the boy in the striped pajamas, which it, again I haven't read, but they're they're all kind of dealing with the, the same sort of topic. I've not read any of them. Uh, completely, you're highlighting my my gaps here. No, but, no, but I've never I seen. I wouldn't bother QC. with the book thief. Well, I've never seen Kavanaugh QC. Um, I know it was a, a big thing it's when really it was good. on. Um, the, this is the only th- episode that Nigel Neal wrote for it, which is why I've chosen to highlight this one. Do you know? Have you seen Judge John Deed? Yes. It's yeah. as good as that. Mm. Is that typical of the episodes? Because Cavill um, is very that, light in this. He's a, a light touch all the way through. It's not like he's striding through and cutting a knife through the course. It's all, a lot that, of that was accidental, really. That, that success by serendipity isn't usual for it. It's usually success by cleverness. Right. Using a northern accent, John Thor. I don't think I've ever heard him use a, uh, not a, a London accent or not a, a Morse accent before. It's always been of a, a more southern type. He's drifting north in this I one. hadn't really noticed, to be honest, which shows what a good job he did of it. Mm. Frederick Treves, who I know best as the... Army general out of yes prime minister, um, he he appeared with John Thor in um, one of the Morris episodes, which I think was the Silent World of Nicholas Quinn. But he's also, as I've uh, found from looking on 
than that. He was brought to Dak in Meglos. Oh, so there's right. the Doctor Who connection. I've not seen Meglos in a long time. I'm not in a desperate hurry to watch it again. No, it's not um, top of my it list. really depresses me that we got that instead of finishing Shada. I'm with you on that. And another member and of the cast. a camp. criminal waste of Jacqueline Hill as a guest star. Yes. Least said there. But another member of the cast, Archie Whiteley, who plays Helen uh, Cavanagh Jr., she died in 2001 age 37, of adrenal cancer. A bit of a surprise to find that out on IMDb. Yeah. And just to give you a little bit of context, we're recording this commentary uh, after we've just done our radiation-themed evening. So we had a triple bill of... Depression. Um, a, a grim fest yes. of Out of the Unknowns, Level 7, and then The War Game, and then Thread. So that, that was a really cheery evening, and th- this isn't a, a pleasant watch. It's a very good watch, but it's not a pleasant watch, yeah. Afterwards, so we really need something cheery next. We, we could do with either some a uh, Doctor Who or some comedy or just something that isn't relentless death in horrible ways because we've done nothing but that now for a good 12 hours. Okay, well, if you want to be a lightweight about it, oh, we, can find, we can find something a bit more cheery. Well, I think I think we're heading towards gin territory before the next watch. Okay, let me did we ever leave gin territory? It, it's past breakfast time on a Saturday morning, we're, we're at Saturday lunch now. I think we're. It's gin o'clock is looming. What is our next episode? What's next on the list? We're about to start our next recording session. and um, Well, actually, we're working on the Halloween special. Ah, yes. Um, and I've got some really fun stuff planned. Some classic 60s um, Edgar Allan Poe stuff. A less than cheery 70s offering. Um, might leave that until the end. A Hammer House of Horror. Always good fun. Is always good fun. Um Knowing your love of Victoriana, we're starting off with the um, Rivals of Sherlock Holmes. And I know that's a, a show you haven't seen, but we're doing, doing a wonderful episode called The Horse of the Invisible. And An invisible horse. What could possibly go wrong? Uh, yeah. Watch it. You're, you're like, trust, <laughs> trust me on this. It's got you written all over it. Um, and there's, there's a, a couple of other little Halloween-y things that we might throw in. Well, the Halloween episode, once we've recorded it, that should be ready uh, for Halloween week. And also, as a little surprise, I'm thinking of doing our first non-English TV show for Halloween. Oh, my. Subtitled? Oh, no, it's in English, but it's not produced by an English company, ah, by an you. English TV company. But Well, uh, I'd just like to say thank you to Andy and Lisa for... Allowing us a segment of their podcast. If and you've... a big, big thank you to them for Round the Archive, which is consistently entertaining and the inspiration for us doing our podcast. It is really. So thanks a lot, guys. So, uh, but if you would like to hear more of our stuff, we are uh, The Extermos Experiment on SoundCloud, or you can look at our blog, which is extermosexperiment.blogspot.com. And we do aim to uh, podcast about once a fortnight. We also have a Twitter account on at Exton Moss and a rarely updated Instagram account called at Exton Moss as well. So do look us up. And if you've got any comments, um, uh, please let us know. But otherwise, we shall pass you back over into the capable hands of Andy and Lisa for their podcast. Thanks for listening. Goodbye now. And many thanks to Ken and Simon yes, for doing that. thank you, boys. It's our first crossover. It is. It is. Perhaps we'll have to appear on their uh, podcast. Oh, possibly. Have you just invited yourself on? Yeah. Maybe. I've got gin. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, I would point out, it, it, although it says adventures in wine and space, it's more like adventures in gin and space. Yeah. I, but gin doesn't sound so good. I occasionally it? have wine when I'm doing you this. Do. But, you uh, do. You do. So we cover both. Well, you like gin. I do like gin. I I, I could could never get used to gin. I've got a rather nice um, violet gin at the moment. Uh, Violet or violent? Violet. Okay. It tastes vaguely like Palmer violets. But yes, uh, Exton Moss Experiment, highly Mm -hmm. recommended. Yeah. Um, As we record this on Friday, Mm -hmm. I believe episodes 10 and 11 of the Exton Moss Experiment will will be coming out over the weekend, Mm -hmm. and they're already getting on with some more stuff, I think. Mm Um, so the, I think the next one is radiation. Yeah. Then then a radiation antidote because I think the radiation <laughs> ones are going to be quite grim. Wasn't it threads and the war game? Something. Oh, don't give it give it away. But <laughs> they'll have released before we do anyway. Probably. So. But next up, mm-hmm. uh, Martin yes. Holmes is back mm-hmm. to talk about some anniversaries yes. that are happening in 
January. Yes. Mo- well, in this year. Well, yeah. Yes. Uh, but th- there's a lot of series that started in, in January. Well, it's the start of the new season Indeed. on BBC One or ITV. And it'll mostly look at... League of Gentlemen. There seem to be a lot of anniversaries about at the moment. Uh, the Avengers is 58 years old. Uh, Blake 7 is 41 years old. Renta Ghost is 42 years old. Uh, Poirot. Poirot is 30. And, and yet, and yet, some things take you by surprise. And one that really did surprise me was finding out recently that the League of Gentlemen, the League of Gentlemen is 20 years old. 20 years old. Now, when I was a kid, 20 years of Doctor Who seemed like a lifetime. It, well, it was a lifetime for me, but it was an astonishing amount of time. And yet here we are, League of Gentlemen, which seems like five minutes ago, is 20 years old. I, I find this so incredibly difficult to believe. And yet, you know, time, time is a peculiar master. And, and uh, as someone once put it, Time is the fire in which we burn. Although that was Malcolm McDowell in a Star Trek movie, so maybe it's not the wisest thing. Anyway, of all these anniversaries, of all these anniversaries, I did think that maybe we should just touch on the League of Gentlemen for, you know, reasons. It was created by Mark Gattis, Steve Pemberton, Rhys Shearsmith and Jeremy Dyson way back in about 1996, actually. Uh, they went to the Edinburgh Fringe. They, uh, <laughs> they won loads of awards they got a radio series which was set in the town of spent and then wallop tv series 1999 i mean okay i may be drooling into my horlicks because it's 30 years since one foot in the grave started near as damn it but the three tv series that, that that were on 20 years ago i mean why does that draw my attention i mean yes 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 they were they were they were brewed up in the in the cauldron of Breton Hall, which is a place I nearly went to, and a lot of it was filmed in Hatfield, which is about 20 minutes up the road, and a place I've never been to. And yet, and yet, somehow it got in under my skin. It's kind of like, well, I, I, I had a job, all right? I had a job at that time, and I was really struggling with it, and yet somehow this TV series started, and suddenly there were a load of characters and catchphrases that sort of worked with me, and, you know, <sighs> we got to bond a bit, and the people I was working with, and suddenly, you know, it was less hard. You know, Edward and Tubbs, you know, in the, the local shop for local people. You know, Barbara, the taxi driver, okay, that was probably a little bit, I mean, nowadays it would be just not even done, but and it was a little bit, you know, <clears throat> funny, I suppose we thought it was. The Dentons, you know, hoist by their own pet toad and the strange nude suits. And uh, Hilary Briss and these, these, this astonishing special stuff. I mean, this is all bringing stuff flooding back. There was that chap who, who, who was going on about being in the caves when they filmed Revenge of the Cybermen. That got my ears pricked up, you know. And, and Mr. Chinnery, the vet that kept killing things, and, 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 and Pauline in the job centre. And oh, it's all just... Oh, it's become so iconic now. I mean, Jeff, Mike, Brian, those, those dreadful businessmen, you know, and, and the one who, I won the mums, and Les McQueen, Les McQueen, you know shit business i mean it's just all there and so sort of locked in those people those old ladies and you want a bag i mean it's it's uh, charlie and stella and 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 the reverend bernice and oh so many so many characters and papa lazarou well who can forget that even though again you couldn't do that or hair lip i mean again subject matter that other series just wouldn't touch and yet somehow they managed to make it into a genuine real world and hey you know something is old when when a lot of your early collection of it is, is, is on videotape on vhs and now i remember buying specifically the the tin the christmas special the christmas special is one of the best things they ever did but the christmas special in a vhs tin that was lo- local shop shaped i mean isn't that brilliant I and mean, isn't that just fabulous and 
a friend of mine had to make the choice, and this is this shows really we were on the cusp of new technology, had to make the choice between buying the DVD or buying a VHS that had a free precious thing. And he basically went for the precious thing. So anyway, go figure, he's probably still got the precious thing somewhere. Now, so basically that, that lonely local shop on the moors was first seen on the 11th of January, 1999. And it's it's still brilliant they made three series okay fair enough the third series was a little bit different and it kind of told a, a, an integrated story over six episodes of the sort of a plastic bag of destiny or what have you but nevertheless and it disappeared it just disappeared now in that last series christopher eccleston made a crucial appearance which made people think that he actually could be doctor who which is interesting uh if you like so there's a there's a kind of legacy there then yay, in about 2017 to celebrate 20 years since the radio show they made three new christmas episodes which i've never been able to watch i've changed i find some of that dark humor too dark now but the, so i watched the first one and thought Ooh, yeah okay i mean it's on the shelf and maybe one day if i'm feeling brave you know but i just couldn't get through more than one you know but uh, nevertheless, The League of Gentlemen, it stuck with me. We still occasionally talk about it at work. And to be honest, here's to 20 years of it. We at RTA should acknowledge 20 years of sort of greatness. And it, indeed, we should also acknowledge those 29 years of one foot in the grave. I say Rent-A-Ghost, Blake Seven, Poirot, The Avengers, they're all there and they all seem to start in January. There are an amazing amount of television programmes that we should celebrate. Today I decided I just wanted to briefly talk about The League of Gentlemen, so I did. And here's to 20 years of it. Thanks very much guys. We didn't burn him! Many thanks to Martin. Yes, thank you, Martin. Yes, another lovely article. And he'll be back again in this issue. Yes, very soon. Yes, indeed. Mm. Um, I remember League of Gentlemen launching, yes. don't you? Yes, yes. Oh, uh, I remember watching it. I used to watch it on my own mostly. And what I haven't decided... Why, why did you watch it on your own? Because having decided to watch one episode with my parents in the room, I realised why it was best to watch it on my own. Okay. Mm. This, the, let's just say the scene involved um, uh, Steve Pemberton and Mark Gatiss doing something you doing don't want your parents to say. Doing naughty. Doing naughty. Yes. <laughs> it's Pauline and Mickey. Oh, right. oh blimey. Yeah. That's, is that season, season three? Season three, yeah. yeah. All right, okay. But uh, what's next? Ooh. Uh, well, something else that started in January. Yes. Uh, it was Blake Seven, wasn't it? Was. it? So yes. uh, we're going to have a look at. The first four episodes yes. of Blake Seven. Yes, to see how Terminator started the series. Okay, hmm. so over to us. Yes. Bye bye. Bye. Our next program on BBC One has subtitles on CFAX page one seven zero. As we join Blake Seven. <laughs> Good evening, Lisa. Good evening, Andrew. We've been having a bit of a Blake Seven feast, haven't we? We have. We've been celebrating its 41st birthday. That's right. I'm glad mm. you can do the songs. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't on the first day. No, take. I couldn't, no. Um, but we've done videos mm -hmm. going in depth for the first four episodes of Blake yes. Seven so far. So, um, in an attempt to mm. sort of pull everything together that yes. we do, we mm -hmm. would send you to our blog mm -hmm. and our videos yes. um, for that. But mm -hmm. I thought it would be interesting to sort of sum up yes. what we've seen over the first four weeks. Four weeks of Blake in, in the, To see how Terry Nation actually sets up 
the series mm-hmm. and the world. Yeah. Um, I might dispute it's Terry Nation on his own. What? Because I think Chris Bouch has got a huge hand in this. Yes. And to a certain extent, David Maloney as well. Yeah. Um, it's not all Terry Nation's ideas. Terry Nation comes up with some ideas, as far as I can understand, talks about them with Chris Boucher. Chris Boucher gives him other ideas. Terry Nation goes off to write it. They look at the first draft, say, perhaps you could change this bit and this bit, and he goes off and changes it and well, comes back. Well, well, I think it I was think. it was the case, certainly later on, that I think Terry used to say to Chris, you can have second drafts mm. or you can have the next episode. Yeah. So which do you want? Mm. So he'd tend to take the first draft and yeah, do a lot and of work. And re- rewrite it, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, do we assume that everybody knows Blake Seven? Um, um, well. How famous is not. it these days, I do you think, know. amongst the general public? Not that famous. Because it never gets repeats. It doesn't, no. 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 I mean, there, there were a couple of repeats on BBC Two, mm. but even those were a long time ago yeah. now. Yeah. Um, I think probably if you showed pe- people a photograph of Paul Darrow... Yeah. They would probably know who he is. Yeah. If only from the scooter adverts that he did a few years ago. Because, of course, um, you know, you've had various cast members on Pointless yes. over, the, over yes. the sort of previous few years, haven't you? Um, yeah. But I was there in front of the telly, you know, for mm-hmm. those early episodes. Yeah. You weren't. No, I was a little bit too young. So you discovered Blake Seven through... Through Nick. Through watching pirate videos at Nick's, oh, was no, it? No, they weren't pirate videos. They All were right. the official releases. All right. Because um, I think Nick showed me the first episode, I yeah. assume. And then after that, he used to lend me the videos. And Because right. you'd, you'd get two episodes per tape. Mm. Um, and I'd watch those, and then I'd give that back, and he'd give me the next episodes. I didn't actually buy them myself, because I think by that time it was quite hard to get hold of them. Yeah, so what had you known about the series before you Not watched much, it? Not much, really. No. No. So, no. so, so how, how into it did you get? A lot. Very into it. All right, okay. Very into it. Very quickly. Yeah. I, I really... Having seen about the first three or four episodes, I absolutely found myself drawn into the series. Mm. So so what appealed to you about it? The I'm stories, sure. the characters? Yeah, the what? stories and the characters. Because um, obviously, liking Doctor Who, it's a sort of different kind of thing to Doctor Who, mm. but it shares many of the production values, yeah. obviously. And, uh, and bits of set. And bits of set, <laughs> and costumes. And, and guest actors. And guest actors, yeah. yeah. And directors. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Certainly for the first season, it's chock block of... of uh, yeah. of directing Doctor Who. Because those first four episodes, which are the way back, Space Four, Cygnus Alpha and Time Squad, mm-hmm. you've got four episodes. Yes. They're all credited to Terry Nation, as yes. is the rest of the season. Yes. And you've got Michael E. Bryant mm-hmm. kicking it off, Pennant Roberts, then Veer Lorimer, mm-hmm. and then Pennant Roberts again. Yes. And for the rest of the season, it's mostly them, apart mm-hmm. from Dougie Canfield on, on oh, Jewel, Jewel yeah. isn't it? Yes. Um, Although David Maloney apparently um, is uncredited on Deliverance. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I forget the well, exact the old, details of that. It's the old producer thing, isn't it? You well, can't be credited for producer well, and no, director. Well, Michael E. Bryant is, is also credited. So that's that's right. the weird one about that one. I can't well, perhaps, quite remember perhaps about perhaps that. Michael E. Bryant couldn't do one bit of it, so David Maloney did some. But the world it builds up mm-hmm. is certainly very different to 1978, you know, early 78 Doctor Who. Yes. Um, because yes. yeah, the, um, you know we're we're into sort of Graham Williams mm-hmm. period now, and and yeah. and Tom Baker, and indeed the scripts are taking on a more humorous they are. role. Yes. Whereas the way back is still quite remarkable. Yes, dark. how bleak! It's very bleak. It's very dark. It is, yeah, it doesn't give you a lot of faith in either humanity or the authorities. Mm. Um, in the in the world it builds and do you think i i always think that's that you know blake seven and star trek are like mm-hmm. the polar opposites they're, they're, they're two the opposite sides of the same coin aren't yeah. they because they both have a federation mm. but star trek's federation is for good really for exploring yeah. the universe and seeing the good in people and and blake seven's federation is basically um, a dictatorship. Yeah, because this this is very, very much a sort of seventies cynical take on authority, yes. isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, you have all the stuff about Blake's 
charges, mm-hmm. um, which are, are nasty stuff, yes. and even more so because mm-hmm. we hadn't really noticed um, how this first episode is is shown in a six to seven yes, o'clock slot. Six, yeah, six o'clock. Yeah, on on a holiday Monday. Yeah, so you've just had. You've just had New Year. Yeah. <laughs> and then the kids settle down, mm-hmm. you know, um, just about to go back to school because mm-hmm. this, this is, as you say, this is a bank holiday. Yeah. And if that's not depressing enough, yeah. you sit down and watch Blake 7. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's remarkable. But we're introduced to Blake. Yes. You know, s- slowly. You, mm-hmm. you start to learn his backstory yes. over a sort of number of scenes. As mm-hmm. we say on the video, I think it's brilliant that it's... Um, Billy from the Double Deckers, yes, yes. <laughs> is, is like the per, is the, it's, it's the person contact. that takes him off. Yes, yeah. you know. So you know, if she doesn't know what's going on, nobody does. No. You know, it's great shame you don't get brains and donut <laughs> later on in the season because that that would be brilliant. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah, you've got you've got sort of familiar um, guest actors, but I mm-hmm. wouldn't say there's anybody particularly huge in in this first episode. No. You know, Ga- I think Gareth Thomas is very much the star yes. here, isn't he? Yeah. In fact, probably the, the, the best known person in it is Robert Beatty, and mm. he's in it for such a short time. Mm. But you, you follow Blake's story or, for you 90% of the episode, yes. don't you? There's only yes. a few cutaway scenes yeah. with his lawyer and, yeah. and what have you. So mm. you're, you are really focused mm-hmm. on, on Blake. Yes, and, and Gareth Thomas is superb. Mm. He's absolutely superb at portraying. First of all, he's, he's confused because he doesn't know why he's been contacted. Yeah. And then he's increasing remember remembering what's happened to him and what's been done to him, and the realization that he's not going to get a reprieve. Yeah. He is going to be sent to Cygnus Alpha, which is the penal planet, and what he's been convicted of is so utterly nasty that it's you know it's hard to come back for the character what's what, what's i think also interesting is that in this first episode the only people that come back you know in in the series are are villa and mm-hmm. jenna yes. and you only get a couple of scenes with them yes. everybody that set blake up for all this yes you never see again do you, you? No, you do see van Lind again do you see van Lind? yes he's in voice from the past is he played by a different actor i was going to say yeah because yes, it's, it's not no robert jones wasn't available not Ri- to, to robert, play robert james. in that one so yeah. they have to recast but i like that because you haven't got a super villain no it's all very much the, the, system. the system isn't the system it is it's the, the villain, system yes. and the authority yes. and there's no clear mm. everybody's as bad as everybody they else are. yeah you know because yeah. i said about alta morag mm-hmm. she's effectively the one that you know, sets it up yes. to, to 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 send Blake yeah. off to prison. Yeah, and you know, it seems very much like sort of a, a day at the office for her, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's nothing special. It's how yeah. do we get rid of this problem? She's not some sort of cackling evil villain. No, it's just we have a problem. How do we deal with it? Mm-hmm. This is the solution. Yeah, morality doesn't even no, Im- no. impinge on her no. thinking here, does it? No, it, they are doing what they feel is best at that time. Yeah. So off Blake goes. Yes. Into space. On the London. Yeah. Strapped into his chair. And again, you've got a microcosm yes. of the Federation here. As you said, mm-hmm. it's, it's probably not even a Federation ship. It's no, been subcontracted. It's been subcontracted. So it's like, it's like all these things that get subcontracted to these various companies now yeah. by various governments. It's you know, and it's it's whoever's put the cheapest tender in. Yeah, but on the ship we meet Avon yes. and Gan. Yes, but we also meet who is it Nova? Nova. Yeah, mm-hmm. who Tom Kelly? Who yes. you don't know whether he's gonna no join. No, there's all these potential characters in this in this episode in Space and the next Four one. and in Cygnus Alpha, mm. and they're all sort of played up as oh that person's probably going to join the crew. That's mm. going to join. He's going to join with Blake. And they don't, for various reasons. Um, Nova's one being because he gets suffocated in in a um, corridor, service corridor. Yeah, and that's only a random thing, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, it's just that could have been Blake. Yeah, that could have been anyone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He wanted Villa to do it, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, and Villa yeah. didn't want to do it. No. Yeah. 
<laughs> so Villa's cowardice actually saves, save, saves him at yeah. this point. <laughs> and you, you can you can see that I think Terry Nation is quite deft here mm -hmm. that he doesn't make it obvious who's going to join yeah. until the end of the episode each yes. time. Yeah. So I, I, I think that's a nice a nice yeah. way of yes. fooling the audience because mm -hmm. I don't know how much pre-publicity there was. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, did you know who was going to be in Blake 7? You know, that's an interesting idea, be yeah. Before you watched it. Yeah. Were you watching the story to see who was going to join yeah. Blake on on his on his mm. mission. I I really I really can't remember. And no. I, I'd need to sort of go back through all the mm -hmm. all the publicity. Um so yeah, you've got Leslie Schofield being mm -hmm. a swine. Yes. But then you've also got the unknown spaceship that will be named the Liberator yes. making Almost a get. It's like it's like it's it's the big guest star, isn't it? It's the star, it? isn't yeah. it? It's the star. The way it's shot, it's the star of the episode. Yeah, because this it's it's the model shot, mm. which you don't get very often because it costs a fortune to <laughs> to do. And it's it's because it is as we say in the video, it's shot from below, so it makes it look even bigger. And it's a big model. Yeah. Um, and it's almost like da da. Here's the well, big ship. Dudley. Simpson he gives it, give it a, gives it a, fanfare, a, a yeah. lovely little yeah. intro, yeah. and yes, you, you do have the problem in sort of the, these early episodes that you do tend to sort of cut to the cardboard cutout mm. animated liberator. But I think mm. it was important to do that first shot yes, as, as good the as they yeah. they can, yeah. and they really do do pull it off. I think yeah. with, with that. So let's not underestimate how important the liberator is as part of the the whole universe oh, no. of, of blake no. seven it's, yeah it's, it, it's... as you said it's a lovely piece of design mm. outside as well as in yeah. you know um so yeah. that first shot mm -hmm. of, of the control deck with the camera sort of up yeah. up high mm. and yes maybe the lights are down a bit to hide a, a few bits and pieces that possibly they haven't finished i don't yes. know but it still does look fantastic it does and you forget how huge it is yeah you know it's, it's... and again compared to the the deck of of, of um the enterprise mm. in star trek in star trek you've got an obvious command position in the yes. middle with everybody mm. else around around yeah. the design of the liberator is different it is and that you've got there's no obvious no there's leader no, seat is no there? there's no bit that says this is where the captain sits yeah it's a much more uh, level playing area. Yeah. So, so although Blake is the leader mm. as, as such, um, if you were just to see a single shot, you wouldn't mm -hmm. necessarily know. No. So I, th I, th I think that's interesting yes. as well. Yeah. And in fact, I think Jenna actually sort of comes into her own a bit in the, in this episode and the next few because yeah. she's basically the only one that can fly it. Yes. And she mm. ends up teaching everybody else how, how to, to fly do it. it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. yeah. So let's move on to Cygnus Alpha. Mm -hmm. uh, now you do have some guest stars. Don't oh you? yes, you have the one and only Brian Blessed. Yes, or Brian Blessed, as he would. And, and, and we had great fun with Warren doing the video. We if did. you're going to watch any of our videos watch about Blake one. Seven, watch the Cygnus That's Alpha a very one because mm -hmm. we got extremely silly. But mm -hmm. I think it's quite entertaining, and I think we still make some some important points that yeah. maybe you don't notice mm -hmm. on a on a casual watch no. and i found that with all of these episodes that mm -hmm. there's still stuff in there mm -hmm. that i've seen these episodes you know loads of times yes. before yeah. but you it's been a while though since yeah. i've seen them and i think yeah. with you and you go back to them mm -hmm. and that there's just wonderful little detail just to just to niggle away at and, mm -hmm. and prize out a few sort of gems of mm -hmm. of information yes. but as you said here um yes we've got gan and villa yes um but we've also got uh, was it uh arco and selman, and, selman. Yes. and as you say again two more yes. potential and played by really good solid actors yeah, peter charles and david ryle you know actors that people watching the series then would have recognized from other things yes yeah. and gone oh, oh they're gonna join yeah yeah. So again, it's very good sleight of hand, isn't it? Is. it? Um, yeah. And as you say, um, they they get killed off mm. very matter of factly, Casually. don't yeah. they? There's... I mean, uh, Selman, you don't even see him die. It's just mentioned. Yeah. Where's Selman? He's dead. 
You don't even see him. He doesn't even get a death scene, Paul. Yeah. So, but again, it. I think it's it's just fate, isn't yes. it? It's just the way fate goes on mm-hmm. that planet yeah. at that time and where you are and where in you the were standing. Room. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Literally, I mean, Villa. Um, there's a great shot of that. As soon as all the shooting and, and fighting and everything starts, Villa ducks under a table. Mm-hmm. Uh, Pops up to get a teleport bracelet, <laughs> goes back under the table. I mean, he does actually stab somebody at some point, yeah. at one point. But that's all. You know, that's that's how that's how he survived. He hides. And Gan only survives because Pam Salem yeah. fancied him, yeah. basically. Basically, yeah, because he gets a, a spear thrown at him and she... she I'm, I'm, it's not quite she clear She sort of shouts to, and she gets it, doesn't yeah, she? Yeah. But she's not standing near him. Yeah. I so mean, maybe the person throws it at her because she's shouting. I'm not sure. but yeah. Uh, Anyway, yeah. But yeah, so Gan and Villa could easily yeah. Yeah. have been killed off, yes, and that, that might that might have been quite interesting actually, mm. just to have. I mean, not not that I'd want to lose Villa, but no. but you know, because mm. of course Villa ends up being the only person to be in every episode to, to get a yeah. speaking part in every episode. Yeah. Well, I suppose he gets a speaking part in every episode. Well, yes, he, he says, does. Yeah. He says at least one thing <laughs> in every episode, so that counts. Yes, he gets more and less to do in yes. in some episodes, yeah. but... and and Villa is. I know there are people that don't like Villa, mm. but Villa is my fav- one of my favourite characters because yeah. he's such a coward. He will do anything to get out of being sent down to planet. Yeah. But once he does get sent down to planet, the planet, he gets on with the job. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, there's that great bit in, and we haven't actually watched the episode properly yet, in... Um, Seek, locate, destroy. All right, yeah. Where the, the alarm gets set off. And he just runs in the room to tell Kelly, the alarm's been set off. Like, <laughs> yeah, she can kind of hear that. <laughs> it's, it's a completely useless thing to say, but he does it anyway, so. But, and today we've just watched uh, Time Squad. Yes. Where you see uh, Kelly come in. And mm-hmm. again, Kelly's just suddenly there. Yes. Uh, as we said, th- this is, of the four, I think, it's the the most comparable to star trek you could mm-hmm. see that sort of capsule being unfrozen stuff yes. with the, with the with the sort of space men mm-hmm. in it space, you could space babies <laughs> he's one, one's got a mustache so he's not a baby <laughs> uh, but you could see that being done in in old style star yes. trek you know and, yeah. and them going on a rampage in the ship yeah. or something and fighting like that. kirk and kirk's shirt Gets ripped. ripped, yeah. <laughs> and uh, ironic because this is the planet Saurian Major, and yeah. Kirk likes Saurian brandy. So, so yeah, yeah. Th- there's definitely some Star Trek Star Trekery star going trickery, on. Here. Yeah. yeah, is that yeah. the word? That's the word. And they've put a filter on it, hasn't? Haven't they? So when they well, sort of. when they go down to the planet, it's slightly got a slight red yeah. hue to the air. Though it's really windy because I was thinking that because Blake likes a huge fire. He says a small fire, and it's huge it's like the biggest fire and it's really windy it looks really dangerous yeah because his hair's going but all do, over the place do you think it's a surprise that blake actually takes callie with them at the end of the episode no, not at all no why no. not because he needs people for the ship yeah she is a resistance fighter mm-hmm. um so she's useful yeah, I mean, I she doesn't get much to do. No, none of the, neither of the female characters get that much to do. Certainly in this episode. Yeah, um, I mean, she gets more in other ones, but yeah. That it was a complaint from um, Sally Niver and Jan Chappell that yeah. I haven't had anything to do this episode. Um, and apparently, David Jackson once passed a, a note to Chris Boucher that said seven. And he, Chris Boucher's just like, what? That's how many lines I have this episode. Oh, right, okay. It might have been Pressure Point, actually, which is his last episode. I mean, as the series goes on, I think certain writers have certain characters yes. that they gravitate towards, yeah. don't they? Yeah. And, um, and Avon gets his fair share of the limelight yeah. because of his relationship with Blake yeah. and Paul Darrow's acting, which is sometimes unique. But never bad. <laughs> he's he's a he's a very interesting actor to watch, Paul Darrow. I mean, I'm thinking that Callie does get you know some some, some decent ones. Yeah, but not until series three. But yeah, but later on, yeah. I'm not sure I can think of a, a 
a real standout Jenna episode. You knew she'd get his bounty. A bounty when yeah. she gets the subplot. Yes. Yeah. Um, but even yeah. then, there's there's not what I'd call. Yeah. It, you know, in in the way oh, that. Um, uh, the what? keeper as well. Okay. Because. Oh got yeah, the she whole, gets it. She gets a bit in the there, whole, I suppose. Um, yeah. Gola. But yeah, if you were to say to me, what's a Villa episode? You know, I'd think something like City at the Edge of the World or something like that. Or Orbit. Or Orbit, yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, if you were to say to me, what's a Jenner episode? I'd I'd have to think a bit harder to think. Yeah, Yeah. so so that is true. And a lot of that is to do with the the fact that predominantly Blake Seven is written by men. Yeah, yeah. So obviously they will go for the male characters to write for. Or Servalan, who is almost a surrogate male character. Yeah. Well, it was a ma- it, it, it was a male character originally, and then Jacqueline Pierce was cast, so they swapped it to being female. It's not Pennant again, is he? Likes doing that Pennant What's Roberts. What's that? Seek, casting... Le- Seek the Cake Destroy. Yeah. That's fear. Yeah, because yeah, Pennant Roberts likes casting female actors in male roles yeah. and swapping them over. Um, so yeah, in some ways, although she she does use her charms a fair amount, her sexuality certainly, and she's quite a male character at heart. I mean, that, now you've mentioned Servlan, let's just say it's mm. not until episode six no, that we even hear her. we even no. hear of her, and she's not yeah. in it that much. No, um, and she wasn't intended to be a returning returning character. I don't think. Yeah. Uh, I think she was just think so ter- good. Terry Nation was pushing more for the robot to make a return, yeah. wasn't he? Yeah. <laughs> he might have made some money out of the merchandise. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. She she was so good, Jacqueline Pierce, that they got her back again, and she's fabulous. And it's great because you get to the third season, and obviously by that point you lose Blake and Jenna, so they make they make more of the relationship between Avon and Servalan, who up to this point haven't, haven't actually had that much contact. No. So... But, you know, people and fans, when people and fans, like like fans <laughs> aren't people, but when you say Some Blake Blake Seven, yeah. you know, they think of the a certain crew yeah. um, and Servalan and mm-hmm. possibly Travis. Yes as being what the series yes. is about. Mm. But this first half of season one... Yeah, that's not any of those. You know, mm. each each episode stands on its own, it does. I think. Mm. But you've got an ongoing thread of building building the crew. Mm-hmm. Um, and then even in the middle of... After you get Servland, you've got mm. mission something like Mission to Destiny, yes. which you, you're very fond I of. I really know. like Mission to Destiny. I understand why people don't like it, because it doesn't aid the ongoing storyline but i mean i am very fond of whodunits yeah. anyway and this is effectively a whodunit in space but it's one of those scripts you could rewrite and yeah. drop into any of the seasons yeah couldn't you could you? you could make it in season three and it would still work yeah I'm not quite so sure about series 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 or series, season four um because that's a very different season um for yeah, so. but I'm just looking at the viewing figures, and yeah. and we 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 had this thing, you know, that Doctor Who. If you look at the first, you know, sort of six or seven weeks of Doctor Who, mm-hmm. it's the Daleks that you know push yeah. push it up. But um, the figures for the first, you know, six weeks or so, of Blake Seven, it starts mm-hmm. up at seven point four, yeah, uh, seven point three, mm-hmm. eight point five, yeah. Eight point nine, mm-hmm. nine point six, ten point nine. Okay. With seek locate destroy. So it builds. It def as a definite build, mm-hmm. and you know how much of that is people just getting used to the characters? Do you mm-hmm. think that yeah. it's it's that um, it's that just that familiarity of mm-hmm. um, the the repetition of it being on you it know from week to yeah. week yeah. and. Word of mouth as well, mm-hmm. obviously. Yeah. And I don't know what sort of reviews it got at the time. No. Um, mm. I, I really can't think of, of many, um, of, of much publicity it necessarily mm-hmm. got. Um, I don't really sort of, haven't really sort of looked into no. it. Mm. Um, but I, I, as I said, I'm not, I think I was there for episode one. Yes. But I can definitely remember episode two because I can remember the stuff with going across to the Liberator yes, in, the, in, wobbly in, the, in the wobbly tube. And I remember the defence mechanism sort of lighty up egg thing. Okay. That sort of Zen Zen projects. Mm-hmm. But let's 
briefly talk about Zen as yes. well. We should say Zen. Yes. Um, well, he's the seventh member of the crew, yeah. isn't he? According to Blake. And don't do much, but as I said in the videos, I I like how unhelpful he is. Yes. Yeah. I mean, particularly he could have been more helpful in Time Squad. Yeah. Because it takes him absolutely ages because they they take the flight computer or flight drive thing yeah. out of the um, capsule and get him to analyse it and basically he doesn't analyse it until they've already until been attacked until it's too late yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he comes up with the crucial information there are four guardians but I, I think it would have been very easy to make it like the computer on the Enterprise yeah. that it just does what whatever you want but mm -hmm. the, the fact it's got much more of a personality than mm -hmm. that and won't tell you how to do things and te basically tells you you have to learn how to do it for yourself yes. I'm not telling you yes uh, You've got to make your own mistakes. Yeah, and, and I, I like yeah. I like that annoyingness. <laughs> yes, if you were there, you'd lose you'd lose your rag with Zen yeah. probably. But on the other hand, you don't want to get on his bad side probably, do no, you? No, because he can turn all the air off on the ship. Yeah, oh yeah, he could do what he wants. Yeah. yeah, if he decides that you're not worthy of. Yeah, yeah. he could go full howl, couldn't he? Yeah, yeah. So, so there is that. Uh, there's always a slight edge to Zen, mm. you know, even at the even when he's his most cooperative. And as you, as you'll find later on with Orac, who's even mm -hmm. more stuffy, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. I mean, yes. we can't really talk about Orac very much in this piece because no. we're talking about the, the, you know, season one stuff. Yes, but, and you don't get all right until the very end of season. But one. I, I think you, I think it's a nice balance of characters by mm -hmm. by by episode yeah. four. You still haven't really learned about sort of Callie. No. Um, or Gan. Or really. Gan, really. You learned a little bit more about Gan in You just get four. the limiter mentioned. Yeah. Um, and, and Gan's woman. Yeah. <laughs> that made you laugh so much. My woman. Yeah. <laughs> well, the point is that I can sort of understand where Terry Nation's coming from because if he, he just says his woman, then you know what he's talking about. If yeah. he refers to her by name... Yeah. People might be, well, who's, who's he talking about? Who's this character? We've never seen her. Yeah. So if he just calls her his woman, it sounds ridiculous. <laughs> and nobody in the world has ever referred to anybody as their woman and got away with it. Unless her surname was woman yeah. and her first name was M.I., my woman. Okay. <laughs> that's the best, that's the, that's the best I can do to save it. it. I'm sorry, yeah. I, I can't yeah. do any better than that. But yeah, those first four episodes are, are very, I think, I'm going to use the word professional here. Mm -hmm. In just building a universe yeah. and, and introducing characters, yeah. so and and people do mock Terry Nation, yes, but you well, know we, the we mock Terry Nation, yeah, I know. But the building blocks He's of a successful good. series yes. are all in place very here, good aren't at doing they? It. Yes, some of those are a little bit hackneyed. Yeah. Um, he does use the same kind of ideas again and again. You know, prison planets, carnivorous, carnivorous plants. Yeah. Um, oh yes, there's Terry Nationisms. Yeah. Of course, there. Of so, course, there is. But, um, but and there is a super, every every writer does that. Yes. And there is a superb piece of darrowing. Yeah. In episode two. Yeah. From from the darrow. Episode two or episode three. Episode three. Episode sorry. three. Cygnus episode Alpha. Three. Yes. Yeah. When he's yes. clutching onto the yes. onto the yes. sofa. He has yeah. little little bits um, that you notice as you go on of, of darrowing, where he manages to draw the camera to yeah. him by doing something. Yeah, he, well, he knows what he's doing, doesn't he? Oh, he, he does indeed. He does indeed. But there we are, and we will continue with our Blake Seven videos. Yes, I'm um, quite enjoying it. And by the yes. time this podcast out, there might be another one. So we yes. might have done we might have done the web the by web. then. <sighs> No, I like the web. It's, it's all right. It's, yeah. it, it, it's daft, mm. but it's it's certainly different. Yeah, the, the decimals are quite cute, I yeah. suppose. Okay, well, there you go. Mm -hmm. It's Blake 7. Yes. And we'll carry on with them over the next the next few weeks and months, I think. So yes. there we go. So, yes, have a look at the videos. Yes. Bye-bye. Bye.
Thank you for that, Lisa. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> we, it sounds weird to thank it does ourselves, thank you but to thank ourselves. But this—that uh, yes, was us on Blake Seven. Yes, indeed. Hmm. And to round off this issue, mm-hmm. because we're already approaching the end. Yes. Is Martin is back mm-hmm. to look at Department S? Yes, starring the uh, late lamented Peter Wingard, mm-hmm. amongst others. Yes, and. We just have to say thank you for listening yes. to this yes. episode. And for the previous 30. Yes, and episode 32 is mm-hmm. already well in the planning stage. It is. So that yes. should be out in February, all being mm-hmm. well. Yes. And uh, I guess we'll see you then, then. Yes. So we'll leave you in Martin's capable hands and just mm-hmm. come back to do the end credits in a while. We will. See you then. Okay. <laughs> a few months before I finally made my first appearance on Round the Archives, I started work on a piece because Lisa and Andrew had invited me to give it a try. Initially I thought I might write a few notes and then try to spontaneously turn them into an audio article, and so that's what I tried to do. Once I picked up my microphone, however, things started to go horribly wrong, and I suffered all kinds of brain freeze, all of which convinced me that I couldn't do it. And it was about another eight months before I decided to try again, this time using a more structured, scripted essay format. Nevertheless, those notes I made were still lurking around on a hard drive somewhere, so I thought it was about time I blew the dust off them and tried to turn them into the article they were always meant to be. Podcast Zero Zero Department S by Dennis Spooner Jason King, Peter Wingard Stuart Sullivan, Joel Fabiani, Annabelle Hurst, Rosemary Nichols, and Sir Curtis Seretze, Dennis Alaba Peters. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about a program called Department S, which was one of several filmed action series made by ITC Entertainment in the late 1960s intended for the international market. This need to appeal to the world, and especially the USA where the big money was, explains why several of these series featured an American or Canadian, if they were cheaper and more readily available actors, in the lead role, in order to appeal to an American demographic. There was some logic to this, although uh, the US success of The Avengers and The Saint also suggests that American audiences might have been finding an essential British quirkiness appealing too, and maybe found a faux-American setup far less appealing than their own genuine homegrown variety. Anyway, whatever you might think of their reasoning... The creative minds at the Incorporated Television Company used to sit around trying to come up with new and exciting variations on the action-adventure format. By this time, the champions had come and gone, but that notion of a European-based investigation team made up of an American man, a British man, and an exotic woman seems to have stuck. And so Department S, the mysterious section of Interpol where all the baffling and unexplained mysteries ended up going, was born. Before we get going, however, I want to tell you a little story. It's not a particularly interesting story, but I thought I'd share it anyway. On one of my DVD shelves, I have a set called The Best of ITC Entertainment, which contains one episode each of about 16 ITC series, The Saint, The Prisoner, and so on. I picked it up in a sale at some point, and it sat on the shelf gathering dust for several years once I'd watched the ones I'd fancied when I first bought it. So anyway, one evening a couple of years ago now, I spotted this set sitting there and realised I'd all but forgotten I'd ever bought it. So, because I was either bored or a little bit a bit of a loose end, I thought I'd have a look at it, and, well, to be perfectly honest, this will be a bit of a laugh, I thought, because the reputation of these series had taken a bit of a battering over the years, not least because of the number of spoofs that appeared, a lot of which seemed to find the costumes and the manner of those later 1960s folk worthy of mockery, despite the fact that such far-out fashion was thought of as being cool, whatever that is. 
Anyway, in the disc went, and because I'd sort of forgotten about it, really, I not quite randomly chose to watch the episode of Department S that was on the disc, which was called A Small War of Nerves, and settled down to mock, and you know what? It turned out to be an absolutely marvellous hour of television, and features one Anthony Hopkins, no less, in an absolutely cracking role about a scientist having a breakdown over the nerve agent he has developed, and his desire to release that same toxin to infect the general population as a warning. And watching his TV somewhere in a gold-plated mansion, young Terry Nation had a notion. Each episode would start with some kind of mystery. Some were downright bonkers, a plane arriving at Heathrow, perfectly normally but five days late, a tailor's dummy assassinated, spacesuits in the home counties, and some were far more mundane, but they always provided the terrific teaser that made you want more, and perhaps more importantly, keep watching. Anyway, ITC made 28 episodes of this hokum before they moved on, as they tended to, to making another idea instead. Jason King may have been the breakout character, one who was so popular he was given his own show a couple of years later, in which his old pals from the department never showed up, unfortunately. But the team in Department S was a very strong one, despite him. And <laughs> if the circumstances had been right, as they almost never were at ITC, a second series, or perhaps more, wouldn't have been the worst idea in the world. Because in many ways, this is the X-Files before there were any X-Files. This was Jonathan Creek before he went to magic school. This was Mission Impossible, but filmed in the home counties. This was Torchwood, with its feet planted more firmly on the ground. It was, of course, none of the above. And yet, in some small way, perhaps all of them. After all, setting up an intriguing mystery in a cold open and then allowing the audience to work out what exactly was going on alongside their heroes was, and is, a fine premise for a television series even now. The thing we need to realise about all of these ITC series is that they remain eminently watchable despite their vintage. This may have something to do with them being made on film, so that the fast editing means that they appear slicker and far more pacey than a lot of the television surrounding them in similar times. But it's also to do with the fact that they were made to be entertaining, and the hollow, empty, tragedy-beset personal lives of the main characters were, on the whole, left behind them when they went to work. Which is another thing the angsty, melancholy, and sometimes downright depressed modern-day action series might want to think about from time to time. Do we really need to know about their broken homes, estrangement from their kids, money problems, or substance abuse temptations when they're jet-setting around the world and giving the bad guys a jolly good sock to the jaw? Perhaps nowadays we do, especially if shiny BAFTAs are to be grabbed and Twitter trends are the currency of popular drama series, but back then we really didn't, and few of these kinds of shows would have benefited from such things. One of Jason King's ex-lovers suing him for paternity, or Stuart Sullivan having shouting matches over the morning ham and eggs with a partner who worries about his close relationship with Annabelle Hurst, who herself is being plagued by an alcoholic hippie of a younger sister while dealing with inappropriate behaviour in the workplace, would not have made Department S a better series at all. But you'd struggle to get away from all that stuff now. And that's what they were. Getaways. A bit of escapist fun, all set in a world that the armchair travellers of the late 1960s could only really dream of, and one which ultimately fed the boom in the package holiday industry just a few short years later. It's a relatively progressive series, too, featuring a black character in a leading role, the boss of the outfit indeed, in 1968 when such things were rare in television, if not the world in general. It is never ever questioned that Sir Curtis Soretze is in charge, which must have upset various of the more unpleasant factions of the viewing public in those less enlightened times but we really ought to applaud ITC in general for developing a far more diverse casting strategy in certain of its shows, UFO and Danger Man to name but two, far earlier than some other production companies of the era, and applaud them for this piece of casting in particular. But you win some, and you lose some. Sadly, there is still an over-dependence on what might be thought of now as attractive totty, quotation marks, or whatever derogatory term was in fashion at the time amongst the female characters. But at least with Annabelle, she was clever totty, and they very swiftly dispensed with the notion of her having to appear in her underwear or a bikini at every opportunity once they realised that it wasn't strictly necessary, and that requirement was serviced fairly well by Jason's various playmates whenever we got a brief glimpse of his extraordinary lifestyle. It is, of course, disappointing that the scriptwriters made Annabelle get immediately into only wearing her underwear ploy in an early episode, having established her cleverness credentials in an era of growing enlightenment, especially as the gentlemen of the team did not have to resort to similar measures whenever they had made an illegal covert entry into a suspect's apartment. And it did cause a certain amount of eye-rolling at Holmes Towers when I was trying to extol the virtues of the series, but happily, this aspect of the show seemed to vanish fairly quickly. Happily, the show's other assets made it a far more enjoyable prospect, and we persisted past this particular display of late 1960s idiocy to find a good, solid and very enjoyable set of episodes to be entertained by. 
and the show is funny too, witty. Whether or not that is down to the influence of the stars finding the humour in it, or the scriptwriters finding aspects of the stars' personalities to play up to, will no doubt have caused endless debate through the years. But Stuart, Annabelle and Jason make a winning team, who seem to play off each other rather well, and have a delightful on-screen chemistry that simply works. All with a knowing twinkle, and a great sense of fun being had. Who knows, maybe they're all perfectly beastly to each other, but it all seems like a lot of larks and fun were being enjoyed over at Pinewood in those days. Department S was actually in production at the same time as another ITC series, the original version of Randall and Hopkirk Deceased, except no imitations, which was a show that I have very fond memories of watching as a child. It's one of the few that I would make a point of watching, and in, and in later years I almost jumped for joy, not something I even think about doing very often, when a repeat season was announced on some channel or other, giving me my first opportunity in several decades to see those shows that once made me so very happy. Such a strange childhood in which ghosts and down at heel detectives would bring me joy but there you go interestingly Stuart Sullivan's car in department s is usually the other white Vauxhall Victor that wasn't Jeff Randall's one in Randall and Hopkirk the one with the black vinyl roof and even has a consecutive number plate with it suggesting they were bought as a job lot on the same day given that the red mini that Jeannie Hopkirk drove in the other show also turns up from time to time in department s you do get the impression that one show one crew was filming on the opposite side of the road as department s was crew were filming on the other in fact some scenes even have that air as if both crews are out on the same street on the same day as is more likely i suppose one crew were doing the second unit stuff for both shows at the same time although i do find myself occasionally looking for their reflections or trying to catch a glimpse of some hairy back grip disappearing around a corner in the search for the next setup or hoping for a swift pan to accidentally catch another film crew unawares oh, of course for contemporary viewers at least one of the things that department s and several other itc shows of the times offered was a slight taste of the lifestyles of what we once called the jet set at a time when most british people's annual holidays might involve a week at their preferred seaside resort and ideas of faraway places might only be the stuff of dreams involving spend 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 style pulls wins after all, despite the fact that the late 1960s was an exotic era, all caftans, flowery shirts, strange cigarettes and the Beatles heading off to faraway places, most people's lives were fairly grim and unexciting. Knitted tank tops and the daily grind and those Olympian celebrities from the newsreels heading off to the sunshine and beaches covered in bikini-glad, exotic, i.e. foreign, women and millionaire playboys gambling in the casinos of the south of France were just the stuff as your average Joe from Doncaster could only dream of. And so, the international best-selling novelist Jason King having supermodels fling themselves at him as he fought off desperate ne'er-do-wells whilst sipping champagne at eight o'clock in the morning with his cornflakes and caviar must have been exciting to anyone living a life that more closely resembled the hapless hopes of a couple of donkey jacket wearing likely lads okay okay perhaps few of us might dream of being shot at and coshed by desperados each and every week of our lives but in the era when james bond was often king of the box office being swept off your feet by a brave smart and clever fellow or being such a fellow must have been the fantasy of many a young and not quite so young viewer especially as you always knew that with their names on the credits no real harm was ever going to come to them despite the occasional walking cane bandage or makeup induced black eye in many ways department s with its weekly mystery which needed resolving through the cleverness of its protagonists was something of a prototype for the x-files although that in itself is now a pretty old show and which became a massive hit in the 1990s so maybe it was just ahead of its time one thing that we did find enjoyable from working our way through the series were the preposterous fight scenes they just wouldn't make them like that anymore one thing to keep a particular eye out for is the regular jason fling as he would hurl himself into the fray from the top of any flight of stairs which happened to be available magnificent stuff the stuff of legend and precisely the sort of stuff that made peter wingard an international star especially apparently amongst the housewives of australia for a time at least until he got caught by the tabloids it is he however who is behind the shiny gold mask of clitus in the dino de laurentis flash gordon movie and he carried on working steadily if not spectacularly until his death in early 2018 his co-stars didn't fare quite so well in their acting careers it seems and whilst jason king would get his own series several years later not least because of those australian housewives the rest of the department were transferred over to the bureau de tv heaven and hardly ever heard from again although several several similar departments would turn up on tv from time to time for dennis alaba peters department s seemed to mark both the high point and the end of his acting career and he died in 1996 like generally seems to be the fate of several glamorous female actors in the adventure series 
series, Rosemary Nichols didn't go on to enjoy international superstar stardom, but left acting to pursue other career opportunities, although it was with some satisfaction that I realised that she'd once had a very small role as one of the street kids in The Blue Lamp, which made me feel suitably happy anyway. Joel Fabiani had a pretty successful career playing similar characters to Stuart Sullivan in several high-profile TV series and movies, although I didn't think that I'd seen all that many of them. Happily, a few weeks ago, just after we'd worked our way through the entire run of Department S, we were watching a movie we'd recorded off the TV which was called Snake Eyes, and who should we spot in it playing the senator, who is the target of the assassination plot that provides the main thrust of the plot of the movie? Joel Fabiani! Only Stuart Sullivan himself, just after I'd really begun to suspect that he'd never been heard of since. On occasions, especially towards the end of the show when a streak of cynicism towards the establishment was creeping in, the endings to the episodes were left deliberately oblique or ambiguous and it would sometimes finish on a very poignant or poetic note, but seemed to indicate, even in a slice of hokum such as this, that the darker anti-establishment and more distrustful side of the 1960s was beginning to creep into the mainstream, as much as it would with uh, Mission Impossible on the other side of the Atlantic at around the same time, when government intervention into the affairs of foreign states was starting to leave a more bitter taste when it couldn't even solve its own problems. Perhaps this is why Department S was disbanded, because it was no longer fashionable. OK, Salou always wanted a new idea to try out in the American market for the next new season, so it was more likely that. But both this series and the slightly shabbier world of Randall and Hopkirk deserved a longer run, but it was not to be, which is something of a shame, really. Now, I'll accept that nowadays a lot of Department S can look a little cheesy, if not the full Gorgonzola, and cheap in comparison to what's on now. Although in terms of a lot of the television at the time, it actually looked gloriously and outrageously expensive. And, like in a lot of other ITC stuff constructed out of the stores of Pinewood, there's a lot of recycling of sets and the directorial style can now seem somewhat old-fashioned. Although it still makes for some really watchable entertainment on the whole, despite its vintage. I also expect except that the fashions and the attitudes can veer from the outrageously camp to the downright sexist, and that some of the shows probably don't look all that great in modern terms. And yet, and yet, I maintain that of all the ITC adventure series that were created during those golden years, Department S is the one format that could be dusted down and polished up to be remade for modern audiences if a modern writer's room could conjure up enough impossible scenarios that needed resolving. And because it was, is, and remains utterly fabulous, they wouldn't even have to change the theme tune. <laughs> was episode 31 of Round the Archives. Starring Lisa Parker, Andrew Trowbridge, Martin Holmes, Simon Exton and Ken Moss. On the musical side you heard Dan Tate and Paul Chandler. The scripts for Blake Seven season one were by Terry Nation, mostly. And the producer was David Maloney.
That was episode 31 of Round the Archives. And I'm not Lisa, because <laughs> Lisa should be saying this. I should. Good evening, Lisa. Good evening, Andrew. We've been having a bit of a Blake 7 feast. We have, Over yes. the last few yes. weeks, haven't we? We decided um, to celebrate the 30, 40, not 31st, 40, for, no, that's wrong. <laughs> Do you want to start this out again? Let's start again, yes. Hello. Hello. Hi. Oh, hello. hello. I'm Andrew. I'm Lisa. Welcome to episode 31. Of Round the Archives. This is ridiculous. Yes, and Happy New Year. It's 2019. Well, we're a bit late to say Happy New Year by the time you listen to it. but uh, It's it, still January. Yeah, no. Um, Welcome to one and all and mm-hmm. all and one. Mm-hmm. And uh, I hope you're not... Oh, that's dreadful. <laughs> that's awful. Let's start again. Yes. <laughs> 